listening is we're actually not interested in being number one in the charts. What we're interested in is, is doing what we want to do and, and, and it, of that being of a quality that we're really proud of and of us just getting enough money to, to live OK. That's, you know, that's really all we want to do. And so this kind of idea that of being the, the biggest and the hugest and the mostest is, is like it's, it's really quite ugly to us. I 1996 hittede den engelske gruppe Underworld over det meste af verden med nummeret Born Sleepy. Hermed var gruppen ikke længere forbeholdt undergrunden, men var nu også blevet tilgængelig for det store mainstream publikum. Men historien om Underworld går meget længere tilbage. I 1981 mødte de nuværende Underworld medlemmer Rick Smith og Carl Hyde hinanden i byen Cardiff. Sammen dannede de bandet Fur. Bandet fik en glad kontrakt og udsendte i alt to albums. I 1986 ophørte gruppen, men Hyde og Smith havde ikke mistet håbet om at opnå deres daværende mål, nemlig at blive berømte og få succes. Sammen med Alfie Thomas, Bass Allen og Brent B. Barrows dannede de bandet Underworld. What kind of goals did you want to achieve at that time? I think we just wanted to sell lots and lots of records and be successful in a very traditional way, you know, which meant having money and, you know, selling loads of records and being famous and all that, which is really nothing to do with what we're interested in. In fact, all of those things we kind of put in a, a box and stuck them away in a very deep hole. I 1988 and 89 sent the group albums Underneath the Radar and Change the Weather. Med disse viste bandet, at de var ambitiøse og kompetente, men ikke særlig originale, og de tydeligt var inspireret af den mere funk-orienterede del af de tidlige 80'ers britiske New Wave-bølge. feel that it's so important to make records and it's so important to make money out of making music that you'll make compromises and all these compromises add up to be eventually getting rid of anything that was good about you, that was idiosyncratic about you. And uh, that's what happened to Freer and that's what happened to Un Underworld Mark I, which was a you know, good lesson really for, for now. Underworld fik aldrig rigtig fat i det britiske publikum, men solgte pænt i USA og i Australien. I 1989 tog bandet på turné i Nordamerika med Eurythmics. When we started that tour, although we we really liked them and it was fantastic to be around them and they were very kind to take us on their tour. Um, we realized that was the end for us. That was that was the real that was Why? the end. It was just it was just was so, what we were doing was soulless. It was just a circus. We were part of a part. We had become circus freaks, and uh, we were just going out and playing the same songs in the same way every night, basically falling asleep on stage playing these things. Uh, we'd arrived. We were playing in stadiums and arenas around America. All the things that we really thought we wanted to aspire to were there, and they meant nothing to us. People say he left her for another woman. But she knew he left her for another call, a velvet crab. After opløsningen af Underworld forblev Carl Hyde i Amerika. Rick Smith derimod tog tilbage til hjemlandet England, hvor han mødte den 10 år yngre techno-DJ Darren Emerson. Rick came back to England deciding that he wanted to work with a DJ, so he found Darren. And, um, and they began to work together. Darren just wanted to work in a studio. We had a studio. And Rick wanted to work with a DJ because the music he wanted to make was music for the dance floor. When I came back from America, it was very frightening to see that my partner of many years, Rick, had now got this new partner uh, uh, working in a musical genre that didn't welcome singers particularly singing guitar players, and we had to work very hard to, 
find a place for me and find a way of, of um, evolving that could incorporate a human voice. It was a process of relearning, um, getting rid of ego, getting rid of the whole concept of a front man, of a singer, really, and becoming just another instrument that could be thrown out as much as kept in. And that, that, that it didn't mean anything just because the voice wasn't used. It didn't mean I was crap. It just mean that it meant that it wasn't relevant. <laughs> Hermed var grundstenen til det nye Underworld lagt. De tre medlemmer Rick Smith, Carl Hyde og Darren Emerson begyndte at eksperimentere med den elektroniske dansemusik. At last we kind of felt we got a home for our music because we could make this music and then Darren could test it out on the dance floor and we didn't have to go to a record label or or to some so-called expert and say what do you think people will think of this and have them change it and alter it to fit in with a a little box that they'd got that, that was that was called their idea of dance music or pop music or whatever. Um, people, if people danced to it, then we made the record. We pressed it up and sold it out the back of the car, and it was the first profit we ever made. And we made 200 quid, and it was the most money we'd ever made out of a record in 10 years. And and that just seemed like a laugh. It seemed like fun. And we were we were we were making money doing anything that we could. Really, I got a job and. And then started doing session work, and um, Rick was doing like a bit of music here and there for a couple of like corporate type video things, and Darren was DJing, but also working in the stock market. So everyone had enough money to eat. Um, so Underworld didn't exist. It was just the three of us making some music that that we liked making, and we we decided that it wasn't going to be a career or anything. It wasn't going to be wasn't going to be a thing for making money, or you know, it was, wasn't going to be taking up all our time or anything like that. How wrong we were, boys and girls. <laughs> we kept the name because, one, we couldn't be bothered to look for another name, and two, Rick and I didn't want anybody thinking that we were ashamed of the past. So it's like, yeah, yeah, we're Underworld. We're that band called Fur. We wore the funny clothes. We did all that stuff. Now, can we get on with this music now? You know, nothing to hide, really. Efter et par single udgivelser udsendte Underworld med den nye besætning i 1994 deres første album Dub No Bass With My Head Man. Dette album skilte sig ud fra resten af den tids teknomusik. På banebrydende vis blandede pladen nemlig guitarspil og vokal i form af Carl Heitz dagbogsagtige tekster ind i den tidstypiske dansemusik. En dansemusik, der lå i grænselandet mellem techno, house og ambient. Underworld blev pludselig den dominerende rockpresses kæledække. Do you feel responsible for blowing dance music into the, to the mainstream? It encouraged record companies to turn to other groups and say, look, what you need to do is get a singer and get a guitar player, and all the things that, that people were saying that, to us that you can't do suddenly became the thing that other groups were being pushed towards doing. And I don't think that was a good thing for dance music. Why? Because dance music was always great to me because it was free of all those kinds of constraints, that kind of mainstream concern. It was about making a record, getting it played on the dance floor, and making enough money to make the next record. Um, and if you didn't, well, you didn't. But um, it started to become about being pop stars, which is a bit of a concern, really, but, you know... Because once, once it starts to become about the cult of personality, and the, the, the music starts to suffer, then it's, then it's not what was great about dance music. And for sure, you know, we were one of the groups that were uh, to blame, if you like, for that flood of um, people that kind of started dragging it back towards rock music. Um, 
nothing you can do about it. You know, that's the way it is. We just happened to find a way of, of working and we enjoyed it and people liked it. But of course, then the industry kind of goes, aha, a formula. Let's, let's start sticking faces on the front of everything. And then, you know, people see that there's more money to be made if, if they make, uh, or at least they think there's more money to be made if they think they stick their face on something. Well, at one point you've got it, and then you lose it, and it's gone forever, all walks of life. Georgie Best, for example, had it, lost it. Or David Bowie, or Lou Reed. Lou Reed, some of his solo stuff's not bad. No, it's not bad, but it's not great either, is it? And in your heart, you kind of know that although it sounds all right, it's actually just shite. Give me the gun. Give me the gun. Do you see the beast? Have you got it in your sights? Clear enough, Mitch Moneypenny. This should present no significant problems. Train spotting came along and uh, used dark train. Born Slippy. Very quickly, there was this pressure on us to re release the Born Slippy track, which we fought for a long time. Um, eventually, because it really wasn't in our nature to re-release something that had done so well in our terms already. It was the best-selling record we'd ever had. What had happened was that Steve Hall at Junior Boys Own did, um, did a survey of all the DJs in, uh, in, um, in Britain, in the clubs, the club DJs, and he knew that we respected them a lot. So in a way, he kind of hit our Achilles heel, that if they said release it, we'd release it. Uh, and they all reported back, bar one, who said it was complete shite. And, and, and I wish I could meet him again, because I'd love to buy him a drink. But um, we should have listened to him, really, shouldn't we? Um, they all said they wanted it re-released, they needed it re-released, all these sort of things. And we thought it was pure arrogance not to re-release it when so many people wanted it. So, so we did. A lot of people got to know our music, and it, and it sold lots of records, and, and financially um, there was a... a fairly major shift in our lives and in terms of notoriety there was a fairly major shift too and in terms of the pace of growth of awareness of the group there was an incredible shift and we didn't like it because it really wasn't our didn't feel like our momentum anymore it didn't feel like our vibe anymore um, and we were serious about the group continuing and we knew that we couldn't sustain this ridiculous momentum and we couldn't and didn't want to and wouldn't live up to somebody else's idea of us we, we wouldn't become a cartoon so uh, we decided to stop and do other things so hence the installations and all the other stuff Darren getting back to his DJing and uh, that was good that was really cathartic it, it kind of gave us a sense of our own identity again as opposed to I am just a member of Underworld and I am nothing without Underworld uh, you started feeling good about yourself and in that you started feeling good about the idea of coming back and working with the others and being generous to the others and giving of you know all your best ideas and stuff again and um, and that's what really brought us back together What's the context of, of the lyrics of, of Born a Slippy? Um, that's, pra that's practically the only um, song that I will explain because it was so misunderstood and perceived as a lager drinking anthem, as a beer drinking anthem, to kind of, the, in, you know, in praise of, of the great wasted. And, um, and it wasn't, it was quite the opposite. It was, um, um, at that time I was drinking a lot and, 
and realising that you, when you got out of the pub and you were, you were off your face on drink, that a lad goes looking for more stuff that's like, OK, OK, all right, I'm ready, OK, what's happening? And the pubs are closed and, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I want more stuff. And, it, and it, it always turned me into a piece of meat, basically, you know. This had a very dehumanising effect. Efter kæmpe succesen med nummeret Born Slippy var Underworld tæt på at gå i opløsning. Rick, Darren og Carl tog en pause fra hinanden for at hælde i sig andre beskæftigelser. En pause, der kom til at vare lidt mere end et år. I mellemtiden fik Carl styr på sit alkoholproblem, og i slutningen af 1997 havde bandet samlet nye kræfter og påbegyndte de første indspillinger til deres tredje album. Den 1. marts 1999 udkom på Kofish. We were committed to a lot of shows anyway last year, so we started playing in May last year, right in the middle of trying to finish the album, which was a fantastic experience because it enabled us to, to really focus what was good about the tracks and get rid of what was crap and, and try new ideas out on stage, something we'd never been able to do before. And uh, it made, really it did make the album what it is. Mm. Yeah, because you've remade a lot of the, the tracks that you yeah. started out doing. Yeah. We re-recorded them actually live on stage every night. We, we, were, we were recording the shows and sometimes we'd have a mobile out with us just to see if, if a magical moment happened. And there were lots. And then we had the, the live equipment set up in the studio and we'd go back and jam it into the recorder. And it was good. It was, we were almost like a sort of a traditional band in a way. Like, oh, let's try that. Oh, yeah, cool. Yeah. And you could try an idea out in five minutes as opposed to sitting there and programming it for six days. You could try the idea out. And if the idea was good, you just recorded it and it was there and you could spend the next six days fixing it. groups that we were in in the 80s would take this live idea and, and, and put a prison around it by, by rehearsing it and rehearsing it so, it so it would sound the same every night. And we didn't want to be like that. We wanted to be able to walk on stage having prepared our instruments, having, having employed um, contemporary technology to free us up, to go off in all sorts of different directions. Um, and, and then just take it as it comes. So that um, for us, there are no, we, we don't rehearse and, and we haven't rehearsed for nine years now. Um, there, there's no set list. We decide on the first track as we walk out on stage. So that every crowd of people that we are together with write the music of the night. My performance is totally based on the music and the response of the people. So if the response of the people is giving of lots of energy. I'm going to be dancing my face off, you know.
Tomato was formed at the same time as Underworld Mark II, group of people who were very disillusioned with the 80s for lots of different reasons and wanted to wanted to do what they wanted to do and make make a living out of it wanted to wanted to make things that they were proud of um, work in a way that they enjoyed and just get paid properly for it what do you produce there? commercials film titles uh, work uh, on architectural projects business strategies for people uh, cd-roms car design i mean just basically anything anything really that um, is that the man with the gun again? Oh, Dad, you look lovely in chiffon. It's um, it's really anything that uh, that that comes to mind, and and it's very personal work led, as as is Underworld. The the idea is really that you just keep working, just keep working, whether there's commercial work coming in or not, because because if you keep producing work for yourself, inspired by your your the things that drive you then pretty soon there'll, there'll, there'll be a place for that. Someone will come along and say, uh, I need something, can you show them? Or there'll be a film festival, or there'll be a talk, or there'll be a, a book, opportunity, or whatever. How many people were you in the beginning when you started? So, same as we are now, nine people. Although there are, we employ more people now, which is something we said we'd never do. But <laughs> there you go. Eh? But we really don't work together. We... we, we uh, we inhabit the same space and we get off on each other and we get inspired by each other and get turned on by each other, you know. And that's the, that's the great thing about Tomato. You get the opportunity to do work that you'd never get to do if you were just a group or if you were just a filmmaker or a book writer or a whatever, working in one medium. Rick working as an installation artist, he's never done anything like that in his life and he's really good at it. And, uh, and through that now, that's... that's, that's involves him in setting up a label for difficult music. I'm setting up a publishing company for Tomato for, for literature. Um, so these things now that you, you, you get involved in, I appear in film festivals for God's sake and I'm, 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 just, in, I'm just in a band and they, they, it's, it's very enriching. It's, it's very life enriching and uh, to be able to one day be stood on a stage to be on national television, to be promoting this record, and another day to be sort of quietly at the back of a group of far more talented people. That's great. It's a, it's a, it's a question of balance of life. Music videos, are they all produced in, at uh, Tomatoes? Yeah, Tomato does them all. Graham Wood makes all our videos and we just let him do what he wants. I'm just, I'm very sick of bands um, coming in and saying, um, can I have a bit more of me in there or it should be slightly more pink and I just kind of think, well, do it yourself then. The technology exists, do it yourself but don't waste talented people's time by asking them to do something and then asking them to change it. You know, it's just like, I haven't got any time for that. What about the, the video for Push Upstairs? It's uh, much different. That's money for you, isn't it? Money spoils everything. <laughs> That's just something Graham wanted to do, you know. Suddenly we've got these things called budgets, you know. Tina lives in Berlin, her boy so seldom on my machine is here tonight. And I'm on the market, but when I'm on the market, words move fast and wild. Uh, we were going to shoot it in... Um, in Scotland, up in up in Glencoe, which is, I don't know if you know, which is one of the most beautiful places on earth. It's an amazing, very magical place. And everybody pointed out that the weather was just far too unpredictable. So we were 
going to play in Australia. So we said, why don't we do the video in Australia? Great, fantastic. Blue skies, no problem. It's going to be gorgeous. We're going to get a suntan and we're going to look like the biz. Uh, and it, I think it was the worst rain in 30 years, apparently, when we got there. It was fantastic. So the opening shot looks actually looks like Scotland, like we're flying in over a, over a lock. And then all you see is these gum trees and then mist. But apparently we stood on a mountain, apparently. Um, we stood on a mountain and there are these incredible views, like you know, hundreds of feet drop. And um, it's yeah, one, of the, one of the most beautiful places on the outskirts of Sydney. Everyone says it's just great. Well, they say it is, you know. I just think they're all lying. Come on, let's have ya! I've heard rumours that Book of Fish is going to be your last record, that you're splitting up, no. that... No, no, it's Can not. Can you tell me the truth? As far as I know, we're going to start recording again in August. <laughs> 